John Morgan, Improvisation of Olympic Style. style is just to get you guys to show up. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of a talk on that, but it's not as big as just the ideas on improvisation. Um, these are just ideas that I've thought of uh, and shared with friends, and friends have shared with me over the, you know, over the years, over the course. It's by no means the ultimate guide on how to improvise or anything like that, but uh, I try to uh, direct this in a form where the ideas would apply to you know, all forms of improvisation, but the focus of it is primarily musical. Uh, let's take a look at first at what improvisation is. It comes from the Latin word uh, improvisus, meaning unforeseen or unexpected, which is really exactly what it is. It's just anything that's kind of off the cuff or unexpected, unscripted, and unrehearsed. Now, that doesn't mean that it's completely new. You may be taking something that you know how to do and just doing it in a different form. Uh, or in a different, uh, just a different interpretation of it. According to Wikipedia, uh, improvisation is the practice of acting, singing, talking, and reacting, of making and creating in the moment and in response to the stimulus of one's immediate environment and inner feelings. Now, there's two really important aspects in that uh, explanation right there, that definition. That's the immediate environment, immediate being the keyword, because it's all about the moment, what's happening. And the main difference between when you improvise something or when you perform something that's rehearsed is when you're performing a rehearsed, uh, whatever, joke, play, song, uh, you're, you're trying to recreate something that's pre-established. When you're improvising, you're trying to take advantage of the moment right there to create something that's new. One of the best ways I've ever heard uh, improvisation described is a spontaneous composition. Um, the, well, you're, you're still doing the same thing if you're improvising or if you're performing rehearsed material. Uh, you're, still, uh, you're still using your body of knowledge in order to you know, uh, share, uh, in order to, to share the, uh, the, the idea that you're trying to get across. The, the, either an emotional idea or possibly an intellectual idea, political idea, whatever it is. Uh, but you're just composing at the moment that it's happening, rather than trying to recreate something. Um, a little bit on the history of improvisation. It was, uh, that maybe not, maybe not be the best wording for it, uh, maybe not the primary method, but it was certainly much more significant uh, historically than, than it is now. Um, reasons for that primarily uh, is, it's kind of out of order, but <laughs> I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, ancient written music, when music was written down, and historically, really, really long time ago, uh, it wasn't written down the way it was written down today. Um, it was more of a, of a basic outline of what was supposed to happen. It, it, so when musicians, you know, a thousand years ago, 800 years ago, when they played a song, they'd be playing a song, but it wouldn't be like this version of it. You know, they're not, they're not playing a particular rendition of a song. We're just playing the song with the ideas that are going in there. Maybe those ideas of the lyric to the general melody. Uh, you can see here the way that this music is written. There's no staffs or anything like that. There's barely any kind of rhythmical notation on here. You have some lyrics, and then you have a direction of music. So there's no key signature either. So there's no particular key that this song would be in. It would just be uh, a piece of music right here. So the world's performing, it starts right there, right? So we're looking at that people who know music here. Uh, may also notice that there's only four lines. There's not five, like in the modern book. Um, and all they're doing is that first line right there is just where you start. And then you go up. <laughs> and then go down. So it's, it's similar in terms of you know, this note's here. You know, you have, you have going up two notes and then three notes down there. But the timing and everything else is very loose and it's open for interpretation to the person who's playing it. You hear the modern music, which uh, everything is pretty much right now for you in modern music. You, know, you have uh, the, from the, the tone of the note, the duration of the note, the, uh, the, the inflections on it. And then, you know, that there means uh, mezzo forte, which is medium loud. So it doesn't give you a whole lot of room for interpretation. If 
you're trying to stay true to the uh, to the piece that you're performing. Also, for thousands of years, uh, music was strictly an oral tradition. There was nothing ever written, so it was passed down from father to son, mother to daughter, village to village, passed around. Uh, it's what we would, what we would consider these days to be folk music, right, or oral music, where you know you have music that came up in different areas because they're all geographically segregated. Um, and then we had recordings, which just changed everything. That changed the way that everybody saw music. It changed the way that everybody heard music, actually, that's all. But uh, in 1857, there was a photo, I forget what it was called, a photo, phonograph or something. Yeah, it was before the, before the phonograph. It was actually using photo technology to record music, but it wasn't very good. Uh, Around the turn of the century, the last century, is when you started getting records, and that's when um, you know, music was actually recorded. So this brought up a really interesting idea that was that never existed before in terms of music, and that's you know I'm over in New York, and I can hear the Russian music, or the Moscow or New York, or the London London Philharmonic, or you know Lead Belly, all those Mississippi blues guys that, that you know there's early early recordings of them. Um, so now, having nothing to do with that area or that style of music, I can now you know, listen to it and then try to imitate it. So it really kind of changes the, uh, the, the paradigm in which people are even learning music and listening to music. So it's obviously changing the way that people are playing music too. Uh, yeah, so we really re to record music, change the way that people view music as common versions, the same exact version uh, became the norm as opposed to just the, the localized rendition or whatever the rendition of the song would be. So, who improvises? Musicians, actors, comedians, really anyone. Anyway. Uh, anytime you're doing something that's off the cuff, it's improvisation. But, but there's varying degrees of that. You can just kind of sit around and jam and not do anything. Or, you know, there's also the more professional aspect of it where you're performing in front of an audience and that's more about performance less than just just jam. You may say why improvise. It's true, improvisation usually is not as good as the rehearsed bit. But then again, if you're doing the same thing the same way every time you do it, it's it old. It's boring. It's boring for you doing it, if you're bored doing it, well, the audience will probably be bored listening to it also. Improvising takes advantage of a situation that wouldn't exist otherwise. Um, some of those situations would be the live audience. When, when you're performing, uh, where regardless of what you're performing, if it's music or comedy, uh, there's an interaction between the audience and the, and the performers, especially in comedy. When I mean, you think about when somebody heckles a comedian, uh, that's more or less unscripted, unless it's a plan, which makes no um, So you have those unexpected situations that come up. It could be something like in, in terms of a band, you know, maybe maybe the drummer hit the wrong beat right there, but everybody was listening, so they went with it, and now suddenly there's a there's a new version of, of that of that song out there, leading to a new idea, which is the other reason they improve It's just just because just just to make something new that hasn't been done before. So, improvisation is like talking, okay? Uh, it's the same kind of thing. When you talk, you have a vocabulary that you use. You have words and ideas that you try to get across to communicate with other people so that they you know, understand your idea. It's the same thing with uh, improvisation. Uh, musicians would have you know, their, their, their chords, their scales that they know, uh, which is technically have to assemble the words together, but like talking, it's not the words themselves that, that have meaning, it's the combination of them. The sum is greater than the parts, basically. Same idea with music. Uh, listening, of course, is a key component of any conversation, uh, as it is with improvisation. Uh, if you're not really listening in a conversation, it's more of a soliloquy, which is fine. But it's not, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, doesn't hold true to the sum being greater than or the whole being greater than some of the parts. Um, also, like a conversation, staying on point uh, will help with cohesion. Uh, <laughs> if you 
kind of go all over the place in your conversation, it's going to be hard for people to follow. It'll be the same thing in a performance if you're going to jump in from here over to here, either if you're reenacting a story or a, or a joke. If you're not staying on the point, people won't really follow you, so it's going to diminish the effect of the performance. Also, uh, having to do with listening, nobody enjoys a conversation where if you have to shout to be heard. So in a, in a group setting, if you're improvising, you, know, you have to give space to the other people who are playing as well. You need to, uh, it's, sometimes, sometimes it's about what you don't do rather than what you do do. I said do do. <laughs> okay. Everybody who spends enough time practicing something has a bag of tricks, right? That's your that's your strength. That's what you that's what you use. Like those are your those are your tricks. So it could be you know a riff on a guitar. It could be a melody. It could be a particularly high note that you can hit. Whatever. Uh, th those are your strengths. Those are the things that you want to focus on. Um, using those things over and over again isn't a bad thing. Uh, because you can easily change the way that things, the, the way that you would uh, perform something, just the interpretation of it. Uh, a subtle variation in how you play it could lead to a really, really big variation in how it sounds, especially when it's in the mix of other, of other, uh, of other performers. The longer you play, the bigger your bag gets, obviously. Uh, the, more, the more you learn, the more you know. Uh, but you don't really want to let go of all of the uh, older stuff just to make room for the newer stuff. You want to you maintain your whole bag of trays in there because the older stuff may be old, but it's still good. Um, also, don't reinvent the wheel. So you want to play something unexpected, but it doesn't mean to play something you've never played before. Like I was saying earlier, you want to use what you know. Those are your strengths. That's the, that's the, that's the way that it's going to really come out the best. Play what you know. <laughs> Playing your style. So style is uh, a really interesting bit of it. Style is kind of very uh, subjective. Um, it's very, it's a very personal thing. Like, you know, style comes in with what you do more than so, more so than what you don't do. Um, if you're going to be improvising, you need to make an honest assessment of your skills because. You of all people should know where the pitfalls are and what not to do when you're when you're performing. Do this by defining your limits. By that, you know, if you if you talk about what you know, uh, if you play within things that you've practiced that you've studied before, then you'll have a much easier time winning it, going off the cuff and using those ideas and just changing them in little ways, uh, as opposed to trying to play something completely new. In fact, if you're Performing and improvising, it's a really bad idea to try something completely new that you've never done before. <laughs> That's uh, probably making a mistake like that. Take advantage of your strengths. Use your bag of tricks and know what your strengths are. You know, if you can do a ripping blues solo, put it in there. Use it. Um, if you have those jokes to deal with hecklers when they come up, use them too. Avoid your weaknesses. It's easier said than done, but you want to know where you're probably going to make a mistake when you're doing when, when you're performing. And kind of steer clear of those areas in your performance. So limits of style. Put it simply, style is based on more on what you can do than what you can't do, right? It sounds really obvious, but uh, sometimes it needs to just kind of be broken down into the simplest form to really understand what it is and how it's relevant to, to what we're talking about here, to performance. Um, when you know where the limits of your style are, it does two things. First of all, it gives you kind of a framework to, to work within, and it also gives you an idea of the things that you need to work on in order to, in order to improve your, your overall performance. Style is also a very personal thing. The more you play, the more you find it will become. That's really, it's really nothing you can do about that. <laughs> it's just going to happen. Even when you try to imitate other people's style, it won't really be their style. If you're doing it for long enough, it'll change, it'll transform. It's just a natural part of being human. We're all, we all view the world from our own eyes, right? which is really what the whole point of performing is. That's the whole point of art, is to communicate that, 
either that idea or the emotion or anything like that. So in improvising, it takes that idea of what's happening right now and just puts it out there. So let's look at some improvisational styles of music. Uh, some highly improvisational styles of music, of course, like jazz. Jazz is probably the king of improvisational music. Now that one was just, they, they, they took these old pop songs and just started messing with them, just started playing around with them. And then everybody was doing things differently. But even within that, uh, even within those bounds of improvisation, they started to form rules of how to improvise. And this is so that a large, uh, a large population of musicians could all study the same thing, even though they didn't study together or anything. Like if I know this song and you know that song, then we can just go ahead and play. We can both improvise over it too, or improvise within the song. But it's the fact that we both know it that allows that to actually take place. Uh, there's blues, of course. So there's probably all in all 20 blues songs in the whole world. And everything else is just a different version of the same songs. It's really, you know, it's, it, it, you guys have heard of blues before, I'm sure, so you know what I'm talking about. But each one is different because it's all tailored to the individual person who's playing it. Well, not tailored to it, but it's kind of, it, it comes out being different. Each different person who's playing it will have a different style, will have a different, um, will have a different presentation for it. Then there's flamenco, which is uh, very similar to jazz and blues in that there's there's particular forms that take place. Um, you, know, they, they, you could consider them to be songs, but they're really more of, a, of just, a, the, just a form that would happen that people who play flamenco would learn those, learn those forms in order to be able to play with other people. Even though they've never played with each other before, they could get together and they, they could get together and just start the song and play. It's like, okay, let's do it. Tarantes, for example, in, in A. And they start playing it. And they both know how a Tarantes is supposed to go. But they don't know exactly what each other is going to do next. So it, it, it adds to uh, the tension that's happening there, which builds up the energy. So you have the energy going from the, from the performers to the crowd. The crowd gets excited for it, gives it back to the performers. And then that, that happens right there. That's not really going to happen when you sat down for weeks beforehand and said, OK, what notes should we play next year? You're not going to get that that excitement, that level of uh, unexpectedness happening. Uh, opera was also an improvisational form of music. Uh, does everybody know what the area is? Area is a it's a song. It's part of an opera. But the reason for area is the reason that they were put into operas back in the you know 14 and 1500s was uh, it was a, it was a chance to to show off the singer. It was a chance for the singer to show off and to improvise over what was going on. Yeah. It was usually they were more they, they were more or less completely improvised. They they turned into extracts of operas and became the songs, and that's what we have today for them. But they started off certainly as being an improvisational piece. Uh, there's still rules when it comes to improvising. Uh, the uh, Songs will have a form and structure, regardless of what the, the style is, if it's jazz, if it's blues, or if it's blanco, even if it's rock and roll. Uh, you can make up the form and structure as you go along. Um, you really have to listen to make that work. <laughs> uh, there's a rhythmic style that's going along. It's those, uh, it's those things that, you know, the, the little things that make something sound like the blues, or sound like flamenco, or sound like jazz. Uh, that, that's usually within the rhythm of what you're playing. So you don't want to, you don't want to abandon those things for the sake of improvisation. Again, it's not about reinventing the wheel. It's not about doing something that's never been done before. It's just about doing something that you haven't done that way before, or not having a set plan on where you're going to go. You're walking down the street. You know you're going over here, but you may go right or you may go left. You'll still get down to that same place, but you'll see different things on there. You'll say different things. Uh, and the tonal style, of course, which would be just certain certain scales would be associated with uh, with different styles, for example. So it just sounds like what you're trying to play. And now we have a demonstration here. I'd like to introduce Juan Jose, who's a micro guitar player. Hi, Juan. Would you like to come up and play some music? Yeah, sure. We're just going to wing something here. Yeah. <laughs> Like. <laughs> uh, Juan and I played together a few times.
times before. Uh, we don't have a, a particular particular idea of what we're going to do right now. Other than I think it's an E minor.
Juan for uh, coming up and volunteering his time here.